1300 WIS. Welcome back to Violence Serves No Purpose. I am your host, Vinnie Stansberry. I am excited about this second portion of Violence Serves No Purpose, and that's because I'm sitting and I'm talking to Ramona Matthews. Hi, Miss Ramona Matthews. Good evening, Vinnie. Well, for those that will recognize her voice, she is a DJ here at 1300 WIMG, and she's very good with production which is one of the reasons I want to talk to you because you're really working in a male-dominant field, which is radio and production. Tell me about that. My true love is radio. It always, ha it always has been. Since I was five years old, I've just been amazed about how radio works. How does the signals flow through the sky? How does it come out of that little tiny box? I just had to learn all about it, and that's uh, uh, for obvious reasons I'm still in it. Automotive... Uh, I was raised in a garage. My father was a shop owner. So that's how that came to be. And that was going to lead me right into my next thing. You also work in another male-dominated field, which is automotive. You are a licensed automotive technician. Certified automotive technician. I I did it for it. 10 years, yes. I went to school for it, got certified. And uh, yeah, I did it for 10 years, and I had the opportunity to get back into radio, so that uh, the automotive kind of went to the wayside because radio is my true love. Okay, let's go back to automotive. I want to paint the picture. What made you want to learn how to change a tire? My dad made me learn. Yes. He said, for me to learn how to drive, I need to learn how to change a tire, change my oil, <laughs> recognize that things are running low. So how did you get into it? It all started with when uh, my mother was expecting me, my father was expecting a boy. <laughs> Okay. And he was building his garage, and when I came out a girl, he said, well, I'm going to have to make a boy out of her somehow. <laughs> my father taught me how to change a tire. I was seven years old, and it was on my mother's 63 uh, Oldsmobile. It was a Brom, mm -hmm. the, the big one, the big heavy-duty ones, and so, and I had to take the, it was a full-size spare. They didn't have donuts back then. Right. Um, and I remember taking the, the tire out of the trunk and putting it on the car, and my mother's coming out of the house yelling, she's a little girl, she's, that's, my father's, oh, she'll be all right. And I was raised with a wrench in my hand. By the time I started driving, I became rebellious because I'm a girl, I want to play with Barbie dolls. And I'm not supposed to play with wrenches. But uh, that wasn't, that's, <laughs> that wasn't so when I started driving, I became rebellious. Wow. And I blew up at least three cars. You blew up three yes. cars, being really rebellious. Ha you have to change that oil. You must. <laughs> That's uh, That was a punishment if I didn't change <laughs> the oil. Yes, you have to change that oil. I mean, think about it. Imagine taking a bath in the same bath water for three months without changing that bath water. What's going to happen to that bath water? Ooh, nasty, nasty. So, hence, what's going on in your engine? So, when I was around 30, my mother always told me always have a plan B. And after I got out of my rebellious period, after blowing up three cars, and after re realizing you really do have to change the oil, then uh, I started taking it a little more seriously. And I also noticed, because I still had a rebellious side, my father did teach me about cars, but I had a habit of taking it to other places. And I was noticing certain garages were ripping me off. For an example, one time a guy was going to charge me $75 for a loose lug nut. Are you serious? Telling me that I have to replace the, the wheel bearing. And I said, let me think about it. Brought the car home, and I'm staring at the car, and I see that the lug nut is working itself off the stud. Tightened the lug nut up, the problem went away. And I thought, oh, that's not right. <laughs> so, so that was another thing that got me in, involved in automotive, and I realized I can do this. You can. Now... Working was it hard for you to get a job? You went to school, you became yes. certified. Yes. Was it hard as very, a woman? Very. Really. Very. Because I'm a woman. Um, it's not a popular field for women. It isn't. It's not. No. Um, but I finally I, I I worked at three places total in my ten years, and I've had great relationships with all three of them. Well, your boss, who called in earlier, I was, your yeah. first boss, mm -hmm. was like he took the chance in you because you knew what you were doing and you were better than the men that had applied. Yes, that's true. Wow. <laughs> well, there were other men in the garage with us. It was at a gas station in Pennington, mm -hmm. which um, is no longer in business now. 
but uh, I was uh, the, the only woman in the garage, and there were two other mechanics, and I was there full time. I learned how to become a service writer. Okay. Service writer is when somebody, a customer, brings in their car, and uh, the mechanics look at the problem. Then they call the customer up and say, these are the things that need to be done to your car, and this is how much it's going to cost. That's called service writing. So I was starting to get into that, too. Wow. But my love has always been in radio. It's been in radio. Well, my, I want to stick with the cars for one more okay. minute. And I want to know, how was the customers treating you as far as you going out and telling them what was wrong with their car? Did they believe you? Yes. Okay. Um, because in the automotive business, about 80% of the customers are women. It is. So uh, the customers, the female customers, I mean, I had a lot of male customers, too, but the females were, were very comforted with me because I'm straight up honest. Okay. Telling them what is wrong with your car. And I always try to look at the most economical way to get your car fixed. All right. And so that's that. That is that. She's, she's sounding very modest. I'm going to tell you now, Ramona was uh, considered one of the best at another place that she worked in, and they were kind of not wanting to get rid of her, but there were men that was jealous of her. So let me <laughs> let me tell you, she's being modest, but there were a couple of men that was jealous and wanted to give you a hard way to go. Oh, absolutely. Because you were a woman. Oh, yes. I don't really want to tell one, pers my, one of my favorite stories. I don't really want to say that on the air, right. but um, I, I came out with a, I told you so. Yeah, well, what comes around goes around, and right. the truth always evolves itself. Okay. So people that tried to be a wise guy with me, I just sit back and let, the big, guy up, let the big guy upstairs take care of it. And that's what he does. And then he brought you back to radio. Yep. Explain to me, you also love football. So do I. Yes. Uh, unfortunately, you're a Cowboys fan. Yeah. Unfortunately? Unfortunately. Well, you're a Pittsburgh fan. Yeah, well. <laughs> <laughs> and that's not something that's actually common because it's growing, but there's not a lot of women who actually love football for the sake of football. Oh, I disagree. You, you disagree? I disagree. Okay, Look how many so women are in the sports broadcasting industry now. Say that. That's another thing I wanted to talk about. You, We're talking about radio and you coming back. There are a lot, but at one point it was male-dominated, and it still really is. Yep. Uh, there is, for every... Three women, there's 15 men. And there's more and more women out on the field interviewing the players. There's more and more another women. Thing that, uh, another thing that I'm involved in is I'm a mobile disc jockey. Right. And I've been one since 1987. I started out with the pros in Philadelphia, did them for about two years, and then I went out on my own, and I've been on my own ever since. And I DJ all kinds of private parties, clubs, whoever needs entertainment, I'm there because I'm a personality. But when I first started being a mobile disc jockey, that was not... Something that you see would, what women do. Right. I faced a lot of discrimination then. You're a woman? I've never seen a woman disc jockey before. I was taught by a man. I could do any job just as good as a man. Wow. If not better. Now, today, all these years later, you look around, there are women disc jockeys all over the place. Yeah. We're a dime a dozen. Another thing I'm noticing now is I'm seeing a lot of female automotive technicians as well. The wow. technical schools have a lot of uh, girls as students in there. Uh, there's a lot of uh, garages in the area. There's one in Ewing. There's a female mechanic there. Her father got her involved in it. Do I, I mean, did I want to wake up, did I wake up one day and say, oh, I want to turn wrenches? No. But it was something that I knew. It was something that was just pushed in my head and I did good with it. It is very physically demanding. I can that I will you. say. It's physically demanding. Um, you have to have your physical strength about you. Okay. You have mentally to have a, as well? Mentally and physically. You have to have a clear head because you think about it. People's lives are in your hands. You have to make sure those wheels are tight. Okay. Because if you send a customer out with their car and you don't tighten up the wheels, they're driving a tripod. Right. You don't want that. Right. You got to make sure that all the filters are tight. You got to make sure everything is tight and buttoned up. You change somebody's oil. A lot of people think it's a mindless job, and basically it is. But if you don't tighten up the drain plug or the oil filter, or if you forget to put the right amount of oil in the car, you're driving the car for 10 minutes. Next thing you know, your engine goes poof. Yes. you got to make sure everything is up to snuff. So I would educate my customers as well. 
about your cooling system, about your brakes, what the brakes, what you're supposed to look for. Um, if you're at a traffic light, just pay attention to how high your brake pedal is. If your brake pedal goes all the way down to the floor, if you're unable to take your other foot and put it underneath your foot that's on the brake pedal, there's a problem. Oh, wow. So give me a couple of more tips for women who really do not know how to motivate or move their car or know when there's a problem. Well, pay attention to how your car feels when you're at a traffic light. If the car is jumping all over the place, that's a sign of a misfire. You might be due for a tune-up. Okay. Like I said before about how the brake pedal goes all the way down to the floor, you don't want your brake pedal to feel like a clutch. You want it to have nice, even firmness. You don't want it rock hard. You don't want it too soft. And you can pretty much know how your car feels. Your tires are very important because your tires is what's separating you between you and the road. You have to make sure you have proper air pressure, which is 32 PSI, pounds per square inch. I was going to ask, what was the PSI? In an average car, it's 32 pounds per square inch. 30, uh, to put it in English, um, you get the air hose at a gas station, put it on your, and, a, and a, the numbers pop out. Right. So you want it to be on the 32. Okay. And so that's the proper air uh, pressure for your tires. Your car performs better. You want to make sure your tread, you have decent tread on your car. What is the thumb rule? Is it a nail or, uh, or your tread? The, un, the unwritten rule is if you can see Lincoln's head on a penny, your tread's kind of low. Okay. So you want a good amount of tread on there. You want to look for wear on the edges of your tires, too, because that'll tell you if you're due for a front end alignment. Oh. If you're driving down the road 